Go? I say, little go. Go, come closer. Mr. Go. Hey, go! episode of Audio Drama Dojo. I am your host, Sensei Hi, Rob, and I am here tonight to talk about Little Go. Yes, that intrepid adventurer of old China, the one whose adventures you thrill to every, you know, couple weeks or months when the new episode of Little Go comes out, and who just had his new and ninth adventure come out last week, Little Go at Hell's Gate. So I thought this week I'd talk about the events that led up to the creation of Little Go. Or at least some of his origins, anyway. Let me take you back to the year 1989. A house on a Saturday night in the city of London, Ontario, Canada, where a young man, bored, wanders into his parents' living room, sits down in front of the TV, turns it on, starts channel surfing, and comes across the Histoire de Fantôme Chinois. By the way, I am now probably a wanted war criminal in France for my incredibly poor butchered pronunciation of that language. And being a Canadian, I should probably be shot since it's my second national language. However, that was my incredibly poor rendering of the title of the movie that I watched, which I eventually figured out translates more or less, well, more than less, to a Chinese ghost story, which was perhaps one of the most famous Chinese movies of the 80s to come out of Hong Kong. It's a story about a young man who accidentally meets a ghost one night. He doesn't realize this. And the ghost, who's a beautiful female ghost, her job is to lure young men back into uh, her demonic leader's clutches. But she takes pity on the young man, who's like a traveling scholar. And um, the two of them have a relationship, and they fall in love. Of course, there are a few problems. Uh, especially once her boss finds out that um, she's holding out on him. And the young man has to recruit the help of the Taoist priest. And it's actually an amazingly good movie. If you ever get the chance, absolutely check it out. So that was a Chinese ghost story. And the reason that that was such an influence is it was probably the first Chinese movie that I can really remember that actually truly made an impact on me. And one of the things that truly ma did make that impact was the wuxia elements of the story. In that scene with the weird music and the guy's singing, the priest is jumping around and using all this weird Taoist magic and engaging in all these weird kung fu martial arts moves that, honestly, I had never really seen before. Like, when I was young, we did actually have, like, Saturday afternoon theater, and when they show, like, old Shaw Brothers flicks and such, but this will sound strange coming from me now, but it just never really caught on with me. Like, I sat and watched a few of them. I thought they were okay, but I viewed them kind of the same way I viewed westerns, which is, ironically enough, another genre that I've only really come to appreciate as I've gotten older. But when I was young, I didn't care for it at all. Poor father. My father actually loves westerns to pieces. They're his favorite genre, but try as he might, he could never actually get me into them. Um, I just had to kind of eventually wander into them myself. And I'm still not a huge western fan, but I have come to appreciate them. As a complete tangential side note, if you ever get the chance to read any of the Louis L'Amour novels, absolutely, they're the way to go. Louis L'Amour was an awesome author. All right, so to continue my story. So there I was, I'd experienced a Chinese ghost story, and I thought, wow, this, this movie's incredible. Because, of course, I'd only watched part of it, and I watched it in French, so I began actually hunting it out and finding out more about it. And it left a pretty good impression on me. Eventually, I even really did track down a copy, and... um proudly owned it on videotape for many years. So a Chinese ghost story had an effect on me. The next thing that uh, came many years later, and when I say many years, I'm talking, oh, good, what, almost 14 years later, 
there was a group of anime music video makers called Aluminum Studios, and they released a video to Rob Zombie's Super Beast of basically a bunch of martial arts action, you know, fighting and such, composed of two movies. One's called The Flying Daggers, and the other was called Kung Fu Cult Master, starring Jet Li. Well, this music video is absolutely astounding. If you ever get the chance, there should still be copies kicking around on YouTube. Just type in uh, Super Beast or Aluminum Studios, and you will actually find it. It's a truly amazingly well-edited music video. And when I watched it, just something clicked, and I said, wow, this, this stuff is really cool. I really should be looking at more martial arts movies and fiction and such. Well, at the time, of course, I only really thought about movies because I didn't realize there was much in the way of fiction out there. So I tracked down a copy of Kung Fu Cult Master with Jet Li, and I watched it. And to this day, it remains probably one of my favorite martial arts films of all time. It is incredibly, just insanely cool. It's just really over the top. It's really non-stop action and adventure, twist, twist, twist. You never know what's going to happen next. And I truly have rarely seen a film like it in my entire life. Anyone who has seen it knows what I'm talking about. Anyone who hasn't seen it needs to see it. It's known as Kung Fu Cult Master. Uh, sometimes it's called Kung Fu Cult Master due to bad spelling. I'm not quite sure why. And it's also known under a couple other names including its actual original Chinese name, which was New Heaven Sword Dragon Saber. That's important because Kung Fu Cult Master, or New Heaven Sword Dragon Saber, comes from a book called Heaven Sword Dragon Saber, which was a serialized wuxia adventure fiction story written by a guy named Jin Yong, who's also known as Louis Cha. And... The reason it's so mixed up and crazy and over the top is because the original story is almost the size of Lord of the Rings, if not longer. And what they did is they took the first half of the story and they basically just compressed all these little adventures the character had down into a single movie. So while the story is there, we're getting a super condensed version of it. And that's why events just seem to jump from one climax to another, because they are jumping from one climax to another. It was an adventure serial, so it, it had a lot of little subclimaxes, and it's trying to cover a lot of material. It would be, yeah, kind of like the equivalent of covering the three Lord of the Rings movies in one movie, instead of three four-hour-long epics. So you can imagine how well that would go, and how much of the story you'd lose but in this case they didn't really lose it because instead of trying to simplify it they just tried to cram everything in there but anyway okay that's fine neither here nor there key point is okay so i found out through doing research about where this movie came from because the movie ends rather abruptly it's the first half of the story so it ends at this weird cliffhanger and i watched it and thought well wait a sec what happens next is there another movie it actually literally tells you okay stay tuned for the next chapter so I went out to research, okay, where's this other half? Where can I find it? Simple answer is they never made the other half. It wasn't a commercial enough success, which is really ironic because while I was in Taiwan, I will promise you that movie now, even though it's almost 16 years old, is still on TV at least once a month in Taiwan. It's a regular Saturday afternoon or even Sunday evening movie just because it's still really popular. It's one of those odd films that was never a financial success, but as a film, people just love it and keep watching it. Probably because the actors in it are really great, the effects and the fighting are really great. It's just, just a neat little film to watch. Stories confuse as heck, but, you know, like I said, there's a reason for that. Okay, so I did my research. I discovered it was written by this guy named Louis Cha, also known as Jin Yong, and it was based on a book. So I thought, okay... Let's see if I can find out more information about where exactly this came from. You know, the internet is filled with all this weird translations and stuff. Maybe I can find his books somewhere. And the strangest thing was, I did find his books. Or at least I found some of them. There's a place called spcnet.tv. Yeah, there's net and TV in there. I don't know why. It's spcnet.tv. And on their forums and in, on their site in general, they actually have translated fan-translated Chinese novels. 
some of which included various Jinyong novels, including some of Heaven Sword, Dragon Saber. Unfortunately, the translation at the time, this was several years ago, wasn't complete. It's still not complete, actually. Fans are still working busily away on it. It's a very slow process. But in the meantime, some of his other books were complete or close to it at the time. And I picked one that was complete called The Book and the Sword, which was translated by a guy named John Minford. I read it, and I have to say I fell absolutely in love. I fell truly, truly in love with what I was reading. I found something that had the spirit of adventure that I had been craving for so long. It was a swashbuckling adventure about brotherhood and noble fighters working against a slightly tyrannical government and plots and intrigue and all the stuff absolutely that I loved as a kid when I was reading Alexander Dumas's Three Musketeers and his other works. So I read the book in the sword and was totally in love with it. Went looking for other stuff. I found some of Gulong's stuff. I found the adventures of Lu Xiaofeng, which is another fantastic story about a swashbuckling figure. And you're probably starting to see a pattern here. Um, out having adventures with his friends and uh, rescuing, dam da rescuing damsels and uh, using his quick wits to get out of trouble, as well as his incredible martial arts skills. And continued reading through the library, and I'll talk about Wuxia in general another time. But the key point is, is that I had these stories that really captured the spirit of adventure and youth and enthusiasm that I found the stuff I was reading was really missing. There was a lot of wit here. There was style, creativity, cleverness. The things that I really enjoy in an adventure story were all here. And that's why I fell so in love with the books and the genre. Not that they're all like that. It's a huge, huge uh, genre of fiction. Covers a lot of territory, a lot of different styles. But the most popular stuff is the Gulong stuff, which can vary from swashbuckling and whimsical to really hardcore Conan-level nasty stuff. And then there's Jin Yong stuff, which tends to be a little more family-oriented and is more just about the adventure. Not surprising since Jin Yong himself was heavily influenced by Alexander Dumas. Again, Mr. Three Musketeers. So, being a fan of this new and exciting genre, well, to me anyway, and uh, something that I knew most of my friends didn't know about, I did what any good person does when they find something cool, which is they share it with their friends. So I proceeded to inundate my poor friends with a uh, steady stream of wuxia. Now, another hobby of mine for a very long time has been role-playing games of the pen and paper variety, not the online RPG variety, where one person sets a story and the rest of the people take the characters in the story, and you work together to create almost an interactive dream, interactive story with each other. With one person essentially acting as God, also known as the Game Master, or in old D&D &D terms, Dungeon Master. Dungeons & Dragons was one of the first of these games. And I decided to do Wuxia ones. So using my uh, favorite gaming system, the Hero System, I whipped up some characters, and I stole some ideas from some of the stories I was reading, and I proceeded to run a wuxia game with my friends. Went pretty well. In fact, actually, it's regarded as one of the better campaigns I ran, probably because I just loved what I was doing so much. You know, my heart was really, really in it, and it showed as I ran it, since I was the GM, by the way, in case I didn't mention that. But anyway, so the key point is, is that I infected my poor friends with the love of wuxia, or at least an interest in the genre, if not a full love of it. I don't think any of them love it as much as I do, but at least they're more than a little aware of the genre. This is important because about a year or so later, just around the time I left for Taiwan, a company called EOS Press produced a game called Weapons of the Gods, which was a wuxia RPG. And it's actually quite a good game. It's a fun game, incredibly thick, like incredibly detailed in its setting. It's based on a Chinese comic book by a guy named Tony Wong. And is a, um, yeah, it's an interesting game. Some things I like about it, some things I don't. But generally speaking, you know, they did a good job. And one of my friends came to me and said, I want to test out this game. I've just bought a copy of it. 
I know you're into Wuxia. Do you want to play it with me? And I said, sure. And we got some other people together, and we went to play Weapons of the Gods. Well, one factor was that, well, I needed to make a character. So I sat down, and the character that I created was a guy named Little Go, who was this young, swashbuckling, 20-something martial artist who lived in the setting of the game. And um, he was a beginner, just starting out in his career, a trained swordsman. And he and his brothers, who were also members of the same sword school, went and had an adventure where actually at first they were accused of uh, – at first they were accused of having killed their rivals from another school because one day this whole bunch of their rivals basically um, turned up dead, and they were blamed for it. What happened is eventually they discovered that a slightly deranged swordsman had come to town and uh, had killed these guys. And our heroes had just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, so they're the ones who got the blame for it. Eventually, of course, our young heroic brothers tracked down this crazed swordsman and in a astounding duel at an inn, you know, managed to finally defeat him and uh, bring justice and righteousness to the land. And that was the very first adventure of Little Go, with me playing him. Well, after the game, I decided to sit down and actually write it out because I, you know, I enjoyed the game quite a bit. So I wrote, and I wrote it out in the first person. I wrote out this story of Little Go's first adventure. And the odd thing was I found I was really, really getting into the writing of this story. Even though it was just me retelling what had happened, I really enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, okay, this is pretty good. And so then he ran Weapons of the Gods once or twice more, and I also wrote down those stories. And then due, due to circumstances, the game ended, and I set Little Go aside, but I, I just said, okay, fine, game's over. Okay, so we flash forward. We flash forward to Rob has started a new podcast, reading The Adventures of Lu Xiaofeng by Gu Long. I wanted to get into podcasting. I was in Taiwan, kind of bored, thought, okay, I want to contribute to the commu- podcasting community. I'll do this audiobook, pod novel, whatever you want to call it, podcast of me reading Wuxia novels. And that's what Kung Fu Action Theater was meant to be, at least in the beginning. So I set out to read my Wuxia novels, got through a couple chapters, but I was finding it was a real grind because the original fan translations were really, really badly translated in some ways. Not to disparage the translator, but there were a lot of grammatical mistakes and really rough patches. And yeah, they needed an editor because they were, you know, quick and dirty translations just done for fans, not professional readers. And so because I was reading them, I was having to spend a lot of time translating them. Well, sorry, not translating, polishing them. And it was taking a lot of work. I was putting a lot of work into it. And the more work I put into it, the more I thought to myself, geez, you know, I'm putting all this work into this show and well, it's fun and all, and I love Gulong's work, and I love the adventures of Lu Xiaofeng. I really wish I was telling my own stories here. I mean, the amount of work I'm putting into this, I could be writing my own books. And that idea kind of stuck with me. And so one day I happened to be going through some files, and I found my little Go adventures that I'd written out, and I reread them and thought, you know, I could turn this into a story. And I considered writing it out as a proper, you know, short stories or even a novel. But at the time, I was also really getting into audio drama. And so I thought, hey, okay, why don't I try turning this into an audio drama? And so that's exactly what I did. I sat down, I wrote it out, and I wrote what became Little Go and the Emperor's Cousin because I didn't want to just write some story about, you know, Little Go kicking some person's butt. I wanted to write something that was actually different, not just a another um, our hero goes in, finds the bad guy, beats him up, blah, 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 blah. I wanted something different to start the podcast with. And any of you who have heard Little Go and the Emperor's Cousin knows what I'm talking about when I say it's not a typical story. But you will notice that it is told in the first person. And if you listen to the opening monologue... Those are traits of the game that I played, how the original little ghost stories were written in the first person. 
it was a style thing. Some of it was coming from the influence of like the shadow and the old pulp detective stories and like the Coda Ring Theater that I was listening to at the time. And so there was a little bit of that pulp influence that was causing me to do it in the first person. But the main reason is because I it was based on these little ghost stories I wrote in the first person. So naturally the first little go audio drama is in the first person as well, as are a number of the other ones. That became a little bit of a running thing in Little Go. You'll hear references to this how, now and then how when he's gambling, he just sits there and tells people stories of his adventures. Now, mind you, they're tavern tales. So how much of these are true? How much of this is exaggerated? Oh, who knows? Generally, I like to say they're all true, but then again, so would Go. Whether that's correct or not, who knows? Let's just say that some of his stuff is probably a little bit embellished. Because they are meant to be tavern tales. That's why you still get the bit where he actually will introduce himself or give a monologue at the beginning sometimes. Those ones where he's doing that are specifically tavern tales. But I have found myself getting away from that and getting into a more conventional, dramatic style, almost cinematic style in some ways with time. Because, among other things, I find monologues really tough to do. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I tended to slowly get away from them. And also I found them not always necessary. I mean, originally I was doing them as setup so that I could indirectly tell the reader, okay, here he is, a gambler in old China, and he has these weird and interesting adventures. But um, eventually it just didn't become as necessary, so I got rid of it. Well, at least I don't think I'll be doing any more of those monologues anymore. I'll have to see. If you like them, you know, write to me and tell me. Uh, I can keep doing them. It's just generally I think it works better without them. I really do. So, um, in a long roundabout way, that's where Little Go came from. He's the result of um, many years of different influences. A whole lot of uh, wuxia and kung fu films and books, obviously. And... My hobby of role-playing games all mixed in together with my hobbies of podcasting and audio drama. Little Go is the ultimate result. Now, I did eventually decide that Little Go probably needed a sidekick. And I had this idea for this story that became uh, Little Go in the Order of the Perfect Golden Dragon. And it introduced the character of Sister Cat, who when she first appeared was not actually really planned to be Little Go's sidekick. That's just something I just happened to throw in. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, why not? Little Go needs uh, a foil. Little Go, while he's a good person, is not the most moral person in the world. And I thought he needed someone who was very moral, very balanced, very considered, very hardworking, dedicated. In, in effect, almost everything Go wasn't. And Sister Cat worked perfectly for that. She's called Sister Cat because Little Go, or Xiao Go in Chinese, is also the term for puppy. So he's actually Little Dog, and she's Sister Cat. Dog and Cat. There you go. There's the pun I've been sneaking by everyone for a while. I guess that's not really a pun, it's just... Anyway. Um, there's my little linguistic game. So, I was very lucky to have... Um, Fiona Thrail plays Sister Cat. She's done an amazing job and really brought the character to life. Fun trivia fact, Fiona was actually not the first Sister Cat. She's actually the second. The original Sister Cat, uh, whose name actually escapes me, unfortunately, was an actress from the Voice Acting Alliance who I heard and thought might be able to do the job. And unfortunately, her audio quality was quite poor and her... Confidence in her acting abilities weren't that great, so in the end, actually, she bowed out. She decided the project, Little Go in the Order of the Perfect Dragon, was too much for her, and so she quit on me. Although, actually, I should say it was mutual, because as I said, her there were issues in general on both sides. And we decided, okay, that's it. And so I went looking for another sister cat, and I found Fiona, who by the way, is the author of the next Little Go story you will hear, Little Go in the Four Flowers of Shandong. Um, last year I asked Fiona if she would be interested in writing a Little Go story, 
and um, she tackled it with incredible amounts of enthusiasm. And there was a little bit of editing involved, but we, uh, but I have to admit, she produced a little ghost story that is one of the best we've done to date, easily. And um, I really look forward to uh, putting that one together. I'm busy working on Twin Stars Episode 3 at this point. Once I'm done that, I'll actually begin working on that little Go episode. And yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I hope you really enjoy it. You're actually going to get to see David Alt see. You're going to get to hear David Alt sing, which um, I'm not sure has actually been heard on the audio drama world before. Um, I was really fortunate to have David come back again. He's played two roles before, Tenacious Tang and Sharp Eyebrows Yang in different episodes. And in the next episode, he'll be coming back playing yet another different character, showing his talent and versatility. I'm really lucky to have him, just as I'm lucky to have everyone else who's come in and become part of the Little Go family, I guess you could say. And, you know, that is one of the tragedies of satellite audio drama production like I'm doing. I really would actually like to meet most of these people. I think many of them are really cool people. And I really wish I could just even sit down and have coffee with them sometimes and we could discuss things. Not even the stories, just just hang out. But, well, they're scattered around the world and I'm not rich enough to fly everyone into a studio to do it all in one studio in one take. Or 20 takes or whatever it takes. And, well, just something I have to live with. But still would be nice to actually meet everyone. <laughs> um, on that note, I will leave it because this show is already running way over time, and I think I'd better stop talking. Uh, I thought the origins of Twin Stars was long. This one's going to be huge. So, um, let's see what else. If uh, you haven't yet... You should go over and listen to the podcast called Snark Invested Waters, which I'm going to be playing a promo for shortly. It's a great podcast by a guy named Taylor Kent, who I did an interview with last week. And uh, if you check episode, I believe it's 79, you will discover an interview with, with me, where I talk a little more in depth about Kung Fu Action Theater and uh, make various bad jokes. Um, the next episode of Twin Stars is due June 1st, and it's proceeding apace which means that I'm horribly behind on it and will be scrambling to get it done, especially with music and everything else, because this one's going to be probably the most musical episode of Twin Stars to date. No, they're not going to be bursting out into song, but there is definitely going to be a strong musical component to it, mostly just because it's lots of action. So I'll leave this episode of Audio Drama Dojo there. Have a wonderful month. Remember to come back June 1st. Twin Stars Episode 3, Dogfight, going to be a good one. And I will talk to you next month. Say again, bye-bye. Snark. Infested. Waters. Snark Infested Waters is a podcast about the horror of it all. Life, faith, art, fandom, etc. Hosted by me, Taylor Kent. The show includes ranting, shouting, and or uncivil discourse on the subjects of faith, politics, art, books, movies, fandom, and more. It also includes cool music, interviews, and uncivilized reviews of the latest movies to debut on the Sci-Fi Channel's most disappointing, I mean dangerous, night of television. So if you like cool music, interviews, and rants of epic proportion, come join the fun at thesnarkyavenger.com Dr. Morgan, look out! thesnarkyavenger.com Dragon, you're 
seeing this too. Swell, just swell. Hand me that bow. You can't hit the broad side of a castle wall. Barn, Atherton, barn door. Does it matter? We're all going to die. Ah! Well, a barn door is smaller than a castle wall, so if I couldn't hit a barn door, I, I still might hit a castle wall. That's why I said castle wall, because you couldn't even hit that. <laughs> Maudlin, a new series coming soon to BrokenSea.com.